Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our uh, ISPT educational webinar. Uh, as you can see from the screen, we have an uh, extraordinary speaker today, Ian Renzi. He is going. Oh, sorry. Did you did you hear the introduction in the very beginning or not? Uh, no, sorry, you were out for about three seconds. It's okay, you can keep on talking. Okay. Yes. Yeah, as you can see from the title, the uh, from uh, from the title that uh, the uh, I mean on the screen, um, he is going to talk about the uh, quality assurance of the CIPP. Uh, the the title is secured in place materials and the system quality assurance based around the performance specification and site evaluation. Uh, I, think, I think most of you or some of you uh, already know uh, Ian or uh, know him very well because he has been involved in the transit market for more over 25 years. Um, and uh, primarily, uh, pri primarily around CIPP, both large and small diameter. Uh, and uh, he has worked throughout the world involved in project planning, specifications and the material uh, selection and supply. Uh, Ian uh, is past chair of uh, UKSTT and uh, is currently serve as a, a, another term as a vice chair. And also uh, he is also a, a board of director member of ISTT at this moment. Um, Ian, uh, let's welcome Ian. Uh, the, Ian, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Albert. That's really, really kind of you to say that. Thank you also to Kyoko for arranging everything along with Albert. Um, it's my pleasure to give uh, this uh, webinar for everybody. Um, what we're going to talk about is basically, we plan to cover a little bit of the history of Cured in Place and and then we want to talk a little bit more about is cured in place, CIPP, the right solution. And I'm going to go, go through a little bit of the standards and the development of a performance based specification. And then we're going to talk about CIPP when it's been installed over a long time and the performance and the condition assessment of it of CIPP over time. So basically, the uh, Water Research Center came up with a generic term for CIPP. CIPP basically summarizes as the insertion of a resin impregnated lined lining tube, which is then cured to form a tight fit against the existing sewer. So the unique aspects of cured in place Basically, it utilizes the existing pipe as a mold to make a tight fitting lining that can minimize the deterioration of the host pipe. It limits exfiltration and infiltration, which is basically the groundwater when it's you know, going inside the pipe, or you basically get a lot of the effluent that could leak into the surrounding soil. It can also, key points are that it carries all applied groundwater loads which is basically the soil or ground or the traffic or if it's under an airport, et cetera, et cetera. At the end, it can be considered equivalent to a new pipeline. So the history of CIPP, this gentleman is called Eric Wood and he's a Yorkshireman. And he devised a method of lining a duct with a resin in the UK back in the early 70s. He patented the process and demonstrated it to the Greater London Council in 1971. It was a very large, I think it was an egg-shaped pipe, and they impregnated, you know, very, very basic. They mixed some resin, put it into a felt, pulled it into place, inflated it, and left it for a period of time. And then once it was cured, they all inspected it, and everybody was rather impressed by this. So uh, Mr. Wood, he basically patented the process and he called it in situ form, which is basically literally means formed in place. 
unfortunately, Eric, I think he had about 31 patents over his uh, lifetime, and he died in 1994 in a, in a plane crash, which was unfortunate. The slides are just taking a little bit longer to sync. Okay, so basically the components of CIPP, we're looking at a reinforced or non-reinforced tube, suitable for a resin to go inside. We utilize a thermostatic resin, which means basically you have some sort of catalyst like heat that would basically make the resin go hard. You need then a method to install and expand the tube and the resin, impregnated resin, to form the tight fit with the hose pipe. Then you need a method to cure, to transform the impregnated tube into a functional pipe. So typical problems that we're looking at, I know we talked about a little bit before, but we're looking at gravity sewers here, and we're looking at the infiltration and the exfiltration. We're looking at structural failures. So we're talking about here, holes, broken joints, offsets, beam failures. And over time, in a lot of countries, we have a lot of internal corrosion, such as hydrogen sulfide attack, which will eat away at the hose pipe. We've seen a lot of cases that we get root intrusion. And of course, you typically, when pipes start to sag a little bit, there's issues to do with the flow capacity. And I'll talk later on about how CAPP can improve the flow capacity. Here we can see a typical example of a before and after uh, with CAPP. So we'll look primarily at the gravity application of cured in place. It can be used in pressure pipes and it can be used in drinking water pipes. But really, I want to focus on gravity applications. So we're talking low pressure heads here. So we're looking at sanitary sewers, storm, land drainage. We're looking at laterals, culverts, siphons. And then a lot of times we're talking about process pipelines, which could be in industrial applications or inside buildings, which are also gravity applications on the sewer side. So what pipes are suitable for CIPP? You've got the least complex, which is a purely round one. We can do all these various other sections. Of course, when it becomes increased complexity, there's a lot more design and there's careful calculations. And of course, key is the operator who's going to install the pipeline. And there's a lot of skill required on those. I would say probably 90% uh, of CIPP that's installed is round pipes. And the other ones, less so, maybe some of the um, so sort of egg-shaped pipes, you'll get some, but primarily I would say 90% of the market covers the circular shape. So let's look at CAPP length and diameter limitations. A lot of times the CAPP runs from manhole to manhole. So we're talking 90 to 120 meters or 300 to 400 feet. However, there are continuous runs of 900 meters, 3000 feet. They have been completed typically in the US. And longer runs are technically feasible, but they're based on site-specific conditions. Of course, we've got a lot of problems. We've got the logistics. If you've got large uh, pipes to line, of course, the line is gonna be quite large. You've got transportation, or if you're gonna be impregnating at the site, you've got to install it that way. We've also got large volumes of, uh, of void inside the pipe that we've got to cure. So we need to look at methods to cure that. So gravity services can go between 50 millimeter to 2.7 meter. However, 90% of CIPP is cost effective under 900 millimeters. So basically for very small diameter and very large diameter, a lot of the impregnation takes place on the job site. And we've got some examples here of a, of a small impregnation growing or a larger site here. So that's basically where the resin is put inside the liner. There is a lot of times that, we, that uh, the liner itself is prepared in a factory. So here we have a polyester resin going inside a liner, which can then be transported to site in cool conditions. Here uh, on the left, we have a picture of a UV liner. Now, most of UV liners are prepared in a factory 
and then shift to site. But we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So what we're looking at here is you can see a picture of the existing pipe and the liner inside it. This is the critical activity of the, pro, of the CIPP, which is the resin impregnation. 80% of the final product in normally is resin and 20% is the actual carrier, the felt. It's important, very important in this case to have a complete saturation of the felt liner and the resin to be completely compatible with the lining material. This ensures the performance of the liner and it meets all the standards, which we'll talk a little bit about later on. So you can see there that the resin is a critical part because it forms 80% of the final product. So what, you know, we've talked a little bit about the materials, the resin and the liners, and then you've got to basically get this liner once it's been impregnated with the resin inside the pipe. So there's basically two methods. One is where you would pull it into place, and the other one is inversion, where you basically turn it inside out using air pressure or water pressure. And you can see some examples here. Then, of course, we're going to cure the liner. Well, when Eric Wood put the original liner in, which he pulled into place, he just inflated it and left it. But 24, 36 hours for the resin to cure is not economic and it's not practical. Uh, it can be with certain resins now when you get uh, much more fast reactive, reacting resins, but um, normally now you, you add heat to speed up the cure process. So the heat can either be in steam form or hot water, or we use UV light. And you can see some examples here of a UV light train curing the liner, or in the other case, we're using some hot water, which is circulated for a certain period of time. But we'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. So here's the classic perfect example, perfect picture of a liner inside a pipe, which has been done, looks great. And then we see the pipe you know, beforehand, which classic picture shows how it was damaged. So you, you know, generally this is what we're trying to achieve. So Eric Wood put in his first liner in 1971. So we're really coming up to 50 years since then. And since that time, CAPP has really grown. Over 75,000 miles of cured in place is estimated to be installed worldwide. It's always very difficult because you get a lot of smaller installers who put in small diameter and they don't keep a record. A lot of main lines, if the clients are cities, municipalities, they know exactly how much they're putting in. But private jobs, um, it's more difficult to estimate. But really, when we're looking at money, this equates to over a $3 billion US spend. And annually, looking at the market, around 16 to 18,000 kilometers per year are installed in the ground, of which probably 60% plus is in the US. The other 40% is around the world, varying depending on uh, projects that are going on. Europe's quite a large consumer, but this is like China. Uh, the market has increased dramatically over the last uh, five to six years. Uh, with, I think, over a thousand kilometers per year going in the ground now over there. So we're talking about a major um, activity in the trenches world, a major uh, remedy. Of course, when it first came out, we have to look at specifications and what's about. And basically, the Water Research Council came up with the original uh, sewer renovation manual, the SRM, which then translated into the water, the, it was called the WIS, and it had various uh, changes over time, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So basically, the standards were developed in 1980. As the process developed and more material was installed in the ground, it had to be updated to include more processes. So water came in, hot water, then steam, then of course UV came in. The standards then became a European norm. Uh, because you didn't want to just look at the performance of the materials, but the overall long-term behavior. It looked at the buckling resistances, which is basically the strength, so we can look at the long-term life of the liner, um, and also the verifications of the long-term term performance of the liner once it's been in place. Because a lot of the standards are now saying that they want the liner to be have a 50-year life or a 100-year life. So we're going to talk a little bit more about these standards and how they uh, re relate to that. 
So in the US, um, slightly different. They have the ASTM, of course, which F1216 is the standard for cured in place for inversion, curing resins and tube. And of course, they have variations which cover pulling in place or if you're using glass reinforcement or they have one for gas as well. Now, if you're going to put a liner in the ground, we've got to think of a design method for that liner. And we've got to consider the shape of the existing pipeline and then decide on what we're going to do. So the WRC, as I mentioned before, or the ASTM, which is the US standard, is great for circular pipes. Now, the WRC sewer innovation manual also covers non-circular pipes. The ASTM is slightly different. They have what they call fully structural or semi-structural. Now, a lot of systems providers, so they could be material suppliers or the equipment and materials, they often will provide certain software and commercial programs that will help calculate these different types of designs. Now, the sewer innovation manual is expected to be updated soon because they're looking at a new version of the design methodology. And there's probably going to be future seminars related to that. Now, other options that can be looked at in Germany, we have the ATV. They also use, of course, the ENDN. In France, they have the ASTWE. In Australia, they have the ASNZS standards. A lot of them are very similar, but if you're going into sort of larger pipes where you need a lot more attention to design, uh, then you've got to look at these other options. So we've gone through a little bit of the history. We've talked about a little bit of the materials and what CIPP actually is and some of the standards that are behind them. But let's look at uh, moving forward. So in every case, is CIPP the right solution for the problem that we've got? Well, yes, it could be. But I think we need to think about it first. So what we do generally is when we want to look at a pipe, in the UK, I'll take the UK, but the US is very similar and the rest of Europe. Uh, China is slightly different. The easiest way to look at the structural and ser serviceability of the pipes is by grading them. And we have basically five standards, one to five. And here we've got some little examples of them. And I'll go through these in a little bit more detail. If we look at what we call horse pipe stage, state one, you can see here there's very little damage. So we're looking at a lot of chemical attack here. We're looking at a little bit of a leak here, a little bit of an offset joint. That's, that's stage one. When we get to stage two, there's a lot more going on. We've got some more cracks. We've got some more issues in there. Stage three, we're really starting to get some problems here. You can see at the top here that we've got a crack. Well, we don't know what's above there. You know, the, 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 you know, how long is it going to take for this crack to get worse and could this collapse? And here we're looking at a very um, difficult type of uh, defects that we've got to look into more detail in. So really, the lining process, we've got to look at the ex design and the existing condition of the pipe. Now, remember that the condition assessment is based on the operator. So it's the operator who's using the camera to look into the pipe He's the guy who's going to, or the girl who's going to code. So it's their interpretation based on the CCTV. We've also got to think about the longitudinal section of the pipe. Here's a good example. Here, we've got the pipe, which you can see moving along. But above it, you can see that the ground changes in height. So basically, the loads on the pipe are going to change, which also means that if we get like heavy rainfall or if you get ground, you know, like loading because of water, flooding, for instance, the pressures are going to change in different sections along the pipe, something to consider. We've also got to look at the flow characteristics. So we've got to think about when you're doing flow modeling, if you're looking at a, a network, we've got to think of where the flows are, where the maximum flow is, where the priority is, um, and what that pipe is, is actually working, working for. So key is, before any CIPP, the first thing to do, of course, is you've got to have to take a look in the pipe and see what, what we're looking at. And a lot of times, the cleaning is so important to get the correct level of cleaning 
There are standards about this and CCTV. So it's, it's CCTV cleaning and then CCTV again. Now here we're looking at a typical CCTV reporting. A lot of standards, but we're looking at the network here. And then we're looking at proper reports, which again, I must emphasize, these are based on the individual who is basically recording these. If the person isn't trained, they're not gonna code correctly. In a lot of cases, it's the operator of the camera that has to do the coding. Now I know that there are systems now that are being developed where they've got remote software. So the, the, um, the software will automatically, AI software, recognize the defects. This is the future. But at the moment, we've got to look at what we've got, which is an operator looking at the defects and recording them. And then the, the um, action is taken on what they've interpreted. And in a lot of cases, I've seen where tenders have been released in certain areas. And the first thing I see is, whoa, let's look at the CCTV. You look at the date, 2010. And we're to say 2021, and we're trying to put a bid together based on a 2010 CCTV. Now, between 2010 and 2021, there could be a lot of things have changed in that pipe. So these are things to sort of think about. So when we're looking at CIPP, the solution considerations, the key items are, we, we've got to look at the size of the pipe, which we talked about before. Does the entire pipe need lining or just a section? So if you've got a really long pipe and you've only got three or four defects, sectional repairs may work. Um, does the pipe, again, have a size change? In a lot of cases, sometimes the CCDB doesn't even pick that up if the size changes are very small. What's the depth? Deep, shallow? Also, the hose pipe, can we really tell what the thickness, how much chemical attack is on there? What sort of head of water have we got outside? Um, do we have areas where we've got high rainfall, so the, the level of water goes up and down over time? Um, and basically the pipe can't cope with the, with the hydraulic flows. What sort of degrees of defamation? Normally CIPP is fine up to 10% defamation. If it goes above, then we've got to think about maybe another solution or putting some sort of repair in and then CIPP. We've got to think of temperatures. We've got to look at the design life. What is actually needed here? Are there a lot of bends? In process pipelines, we have a lot of chemicals, we have a lot of um, strange materials that go through, which can cause uh, different types of aggression, of, of attack. So we've got to basically look at different types of resin, which will resist that. Also, then we've got to think about the site considerations. Where is this pipe? Where is it situated? What's around it? You know, are we in a residential area? Are we in, the, in, a, in an environmental, in a, in a, environmental area? Um, what sort of types of soil have we got, degrees of compaction? And also, what sort of time we've got? What have we got? How long have we got to put this in the ground? So those are the questions. Now, who's best to make these decisions? So, let's, so who can design the liner? Let's look at these people. We've got the client. We've got a consultant. We've got a contractor. We've got a supplier. And we've got a QS, quantity surveyor. Now, these people are all involved in a project. So when we're looking at the liner, the CPP liner, who would be best to design it? Would the client, would they really know what's going on? Consultant, absolutely, that's why they're employed. The contractor, they've got to have the experience to put it in the ground. The supplier, they're the guys who are going to supply the materials. Quality surveyor, he's looking at the numbers. Not the best choice. So what type of liner are we going to, so that was the design. So what type of liner are we going to use? Well, the client, sometimes they'll know what they want. Consultant, yep, as I said before. Quantity surveyor, again, we're not quite sure here. Sometimes the client may not know what is best. So we've got to think about these. So then when we go to i put a chart together here. So who, when we talk about specifying the liner and the, and the thickness of the liner, this is for the design. We put the thicknesses on one side, basically that this is the thickness of the felt, which goes typically from three millimeters, let's say to 12. We were looking at the bargain basement, cheap and cheerful, low spec, medium spec, high spec. So let's look at the first one. We've got our quantity surveyor. 
Now, where's he going to go? Cheap and cheerful every time. It's not what you need. Let's look at the consultant. Well, we know where he's going to go. High spec, make sure everything's covered. Great. We're looking at the supplier and the contractor. We know where they'll go. High end every time. Now, you can see that we've got a little bit of a, um, we're not sure where the best place to go here. And the worst thing we can have is this guy coming to town, the cowboy, where everything's going to collapse and it's cheap and cheerful. Then the guy rides off on his horse and we've got a really bad job. Industry gets a bad name. Products get a bad name. Everybody gets a bad name. It's not what we want. So what happens when it goes wrong? Well, here's some good examples. That's the heart rate. And you bring in the, the, the digger, the backhoe, and this is the sort of thing when things go wrong. And that could be for a million reasons, and I'll go through some of those later on. So how do we know what to use? Okay. We do the research, websites. We issue questionnaires. We're looking at case studies. You know, if, you, if you're contracting, you can be very proud, so we always want to put case studies out. Let's talk, let's talk the International Society or the local societies for trenches. Let's look at who's on the members. Let's speak to people there. Register, register a query. There are a lot of suppliers of CFPP materials. Let's talk to them. You know, see, look at the manufacturers and look at who um, and who they're using. And ask contractors which company they use. Get some more information. So, Again, we're, question, we're scratching our heads and saying, which materials should I specify? Summary, this really depends on the paint that's going to be lined. How much time you have available, what the thickness is going to be, and what does the design require? Do you want a high buckling resistance, good chemical resistance, flexibility? Does it need to be leak tight? The key advice on something like this is to produce what we call um, a performance specification. And then you can give this to the CFPP contractors and suppliers, and they can advise you. So here is an example of what I call a performance specification. So you're looking at, you've got the pipe reference. We're looking at the horse pipe. In this case, VC, it's vitreous clay. What's the use? Foul. What's the diameter? What's the thickness? We don't know, but we assume we put some numbers down. Horse pipe state fully deteriorated. Well, we can actually reference that from specifications. What sort of loading have we got? Well, this one says is actually underneath a railway. So we know what the groundwater level is. Initial defamation, 5%. That's based on the CCTV condition assessment and the interpretation. We put in a risk factor. Here we've got a friend, design life, 50 years. Special chemical considerations. It's a drainage pipe. It's foul, standard. It's not uh, anything special. So then we go through under the highway, under a railway. What sort of liner? Well, when you're going under a highway or a railway, you want to be looking at structural because you want this long life. You don't want it to be taking risks. Um, here we're looking at non-standard this. They've proposed in this case a UVQ GRP. Okay. Uh, that needs a bit of debate. So the curing method would be UV, ultraviolet. Here we can put something in about the thickness calculations, which will have something behind that to support this. We talk about short-term and long-term e-modulus. Short-term being a short-term test, we're looking at the basically the buckling resistance of the liner. The long-term is where they do what's called a 10,000 hour test, and we can test that over time. These are done independently, so that information will be available. Same with the bending tests. Does the liner need to have a WRC or DWT approved? Or in the, in the States, ASTM, independent testing? Do we need to have abrasion tests, et cetera, et cetera? And we can put a coefficient of friction. So this is like a summary which helps if you've got a large project to focus and guide. And what we're trying to do is take out the risk and make sure that the product that goes in the ground is, su is suitable for purpose or fit for purpose, and we're going to get the long-term life from it. So again, what I mentioned before, we had 
the groundwater, which is a real, it's with CIPP, groundwater can kill a liner very quickly because people underestimate the weight and also the, the way it can actually crush a liner over time, especially if the hose pipe is, is partially deteriorated. Looking at loadings, here's some great examples. With a lot of CIPP, I was involved in a job at Heathrow where the, uh, the designs took three days for the guys to come up with the designs for the, um, the loadings. Here's a typical design where we take the pipe I won't go into the detail, we can look at the water tables, and this would then transfer into, into formal calculations. So when we're designing no dig, we've got to look at the head of water, when we're going to install it, or the depth of the manhole, number of bends, the, the hose pipe material and thickness, and these other areas, the live loads and temperature, which we talked about before. One of the areas on site to consider with CIPP, whether you're using UV or steam or hot water, in many cases, you need to put in bypass, which basically means you isolate the pipe that's going to be lined and you need to put bypass, which is basically two pumps or one pump and you put a pipe around it. Now that can be one of the most expensive parts because if you've got a lot of housing or if you're in an environmental area, um, this could be a serious planning that is required and it's a cost for the, job, for, the, for the project. Here's an example in a residential area. We're looking here, these are um, where we're installing inversion. So we're looking at a, at, a, at a head of water. So we have to build a scaffold tower. This one here, right next to a rail track. The planning and the health and safety are major considerations here. So the space requirements for installing the liner are critical. Traffic management systems, you know, if it's a busy road or even if it's a small road, it's a serious consideration. I know in Japan, that is one of the critical areas because they actually have humans 24-7 on the, on, the, um, on the project uh, guiding the traffic. So it's a major cost uh, implication. Lifting the liner itself, you can see here we've got a UV liner. Serious job. So you, you've got to bring in cranes. Here we've got where they're doing an impregnation on the site when they're pulling things in. And here it's just stripped, the, it, the impregnation took place in a factory and they're bringing it to site. UV lining, smaller print footprint. Um, in the UK now, it's about 35% of the market in, the, in Germany, probably about 75%. And in the US, between five and 10% with growing, very environmental, but you still need a footprint. You still need to pull in the liner. You still need to have the, chain, uh, the, the light trains installed. Here's some large diameter UV. So the UV liner being manufactured off site. Hot water, again, some of the pictures we've seen before. A lot of rail, so it's right next to the tube line in London, this one. So you can see what the issue is there for the, just from the installation and the planning point of view. There's another wet out in the States, but it's in the main residential area. So you've got a, considerations of noise, considerations of smell, uh, et cetera. Again, steam curing. So let's look at a little case study. This uh, is an interesting job that took place uh, by a contractor to Thames Water. So, and it involved network rail. So let's look at the problem. How bad is it? This is an egg-shaped sewer. You can see here, we've got one brick that looks like it's a little bit um, gonna, gonna fall down. So you're thinking, okay, we could, we could maybe put in a joint seal, then we could line it, we could do this, that, and the other. But before we do that, let's take a little look about what's above ground. It's right under one of the main commuter rails into central London. So here you can see where the issues are and where the defect was, okay? So the problem was if they had to stop the trains, it's a 1 million euros per hour damages that's gonna, that's gonna be caused. So when you, when you 
repair this, and if you teach, let's assume you're going to use CIPP, you've got to get it right. It's got to be planned. But in the meantime, you have to stabilize the pipe and then you put the repair in. But this job, which happened about two years ago, basically got a lot of people focused and things happened very, very quickly for obvious reasons. Now, because I was quite involved in, in this, um, I'm going to give you a little example about Singapore with CIPP. Singapore, it's a very small, but very heavy, pop, heavily populated country um, with 5.4 million people living there. Now, the, basically the British built a lot of the network of the sewers, which is based on the British system over there. And in the early 1990s, the uh, Ministry of Environment carried out sort of investigations that had a few problems, blockages and things like this. And they did some cleaning and they started to look at the oldest sewer network, which was based in Chinatown. So putting the cameras in, they found that there was a mass of structural problems. Now, the WRC were very involved in this from the UK because the relationship's very, very um, strong. So they started to look at, oh, what can we do? So, correctly so, they looked at pilot schemes. And here's, over the last few years, what they've actually done. So you can see the amount of kilometres rehab. So they started off with 27, and it was a small pilot of four, and they went right through. They had pre-qualification initially, but then when things started to move, they took pre-qualification out. Equipment provided was not an issue, but structural, so they wanted fully structural in every case. They say infiltration wasn't the main problem, but it actually was, which they found out later on. So this, this was because in, in Singapore, typically you get very, very heavy rainfall. So the network was taking on a lot of uh, wastewater which was causing increased costs at the treatment plants, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, they, the majority was with cured in place. They did use some other forms. Uh, the lateral lining came in later. Um, they, did a lot, they, they did a lot of private drains uh, later on. And UV is only used in phase four, but only in a very small amount. But to summarize, about 65% of the entire network within Singapore has been rehabbed. So you can see there the total of over 2,200 kilometers. And this is the sort of time over there that has been done. So it is a proven technology. So what's happening is the contractor, when he's installing, is producing a new pipe on site that day. The materials will have the manufacturer's quality assurance. There are potential issues with impregnation. There's potential issues with transporting the liner to site. We have stresses when we install, and you could have potential damage. We've got weather issues, and of course, we've got curing issues. So basically, many factors will affect what is actually created on the day of installation. So what can sort of go wrong? We can see examples here where we've got the pipes not the pipes bigger than the liner, the liner's less. We've got wrinkles here and we've got wrinkles there, but what's acceptable and what's not. So typical defects here you can look at pinholes. Here the seam is split and we've got infiltration coming in. Here we've got pinholing more, more there, nasty wrinkles. Here is a complete tear. Here we've got nasty wrinkles and here's another tear. These are sort of things that can happen. So we're looking here at a liner that was installed in 2015. Beautiful. But then we get to 2019, you can see that there's some deterioration in the liner itself. And in a lot of cases, private or even industrial, People are asking for warranty, which could be one year, could be five years, could be even longer. So what do we do for quality checking? All manufactured processes need an audible process to ensure quality and design. Is this CIPP, is the cured in place liner fully cured? Is it watertight? What are its long-term properties and could it actually collapse even though it's been installed? 
So there, are, there is testing, of course, you know, but after the installation of a liner, often, you know, we, we the, the, the look at sample testing, you'll put a camera in and they may do a pressure test. But how sufficient is this and how long will the liner last over time? My question also is, how many liners are inspected after the initial post-installation inspection? And basically, in many cases, it's only if there's later a problem or a collapse. So the liner is installed, it's looked at, great, we've put the report in, job's a good one. Nothing, it's never looked at again for years. So you don't really know what's there. So with regard to sample testing, this process relates to the inspection testing requirements. So it basically includes looking at the buckling resistance, the leak tightness and the quality. And I'll talk a little bit. So what happens is, and this is from IKT, uh, the, the biggest test house in Germany, they take samples from the liner that's been installed. It's, it's monetary in Germany, and they will do three or four different tests on them. But of course, there's questions about where the, liners, where the sample should be taken from the liner, how many liners should be checked, and should we differentiate between small and large liners? So if you look at the, um, the EN, the European standards, at lining defect characterizations, what they're saying is the post-lining inspection, so once the line is installed, we should basically perform full CCTV. Well, yeah, that's just basically a look-see because, you know, we're looking at... Um, you're not going to see cracks and things like this because they may form later. You will see certain things. If there's a warranty period, when the warranty is about to expire, there should be a full CCDV inspection. And also with larger diameter pipes, um, they've got to basically look at the conforming to the actual host pipe. But is that really sufficient? I mean, over time, we can see that the liner can degrade. And if liners are designed for 50 years or even 100 years, what's acceptable, what's actually being done to, to basically quantify, because when we take a sample, we do the buckling tests or the e-modulus, we do a long-term extrapolation, which we assume is going to be the results at the end when the liner is, um, is still there. So the standards can be a little bit vague. So when we look at the amount of CAPP liner installed around the world, very little testing or verification has been undertaken once the line has been installed. Germany being the exception, where it's mandatory for, for sample testing. And people are relying mainly on visual inspection to approve. But the CCDV can only identify deterioration or defect that's easily identified visually. And sometimes liner distortion can be a little bit difficult to identify. And it's not possible to evaluate the intermediate uh, stages of deterioration. So if something's going to happen bad, it may take time and the CCDB doesn't pick it up. So here's some good examples where we have a missed lateral connection. Here's an example of what we call delamination because the felt liner often has a coating. So in some cases, the coating is basically not compatible with the resin. So when the resin cures, the, it gives off a gas, CO2 maybe, or the heat basically means that the liner coating starts to deform, so you get bubbles. Um, and I've been involved in, in things like this. This is where basically the supplier basically didn't provide the right liner and resin, they weren't compatible. Or sometimes they didn't know because it happened two, three years later down the line that you start to get delamination. So there's movement looking into more detail, providing pre and post rehabilitation assessment to ensure that what we put in the ground meets the standards. So you can physically see that implementation of ongoing post installation condition assessment standards. So if the liners are designed for 50 to 100 years, then it's important to ensure that they are prepared and installed to meet this. So basically here we're looking at CPP liner being installed on day one. And then we look at day 18,000 and they should both be the same because that's what, that's what we need at the end of the day. So in summary, basically CAPP we know has been around for 50 years. And really the initial liner that went in the ground with Eric Woods put in, um, Aegeon who now owns in City Form, every so often they go down there and they take a sample 
of that original liner and they do a test. And the actual tests are amazing on how well that liner has performed. So they actually now have, so if it's designed 50 years, they can actually say that was installed 50 years ago. We know that thousands of miles and kilometers have been successfully installed with CFPP. It's a brilliant product. But the standards exist to ensure that the materials are fit for purpose. The development of a performance specification ensures that the materials and the installation method fit the project requirements. However, post-lining condition assessment testing needs to be improved to ensure the long-term characteristics of the installed liner meet the initial design. Now, here's an interesting one just to finish off. Back in Singapore a few years ago, Mr. Trump and Kim Jong-un met for a talk. So before this, they wanted all the security guys arrive and they wanted to make sure that all the pipes were fit for purpose, that they weren't hiding any, uh, anything nasty in there. So they did a lot of CCTV inspection on pipes that were already lined. So here's a great example. And as you can see here, the lining it, the liner looks perfect. And this is probably a few years old, but when they were going down, look what was living in the pipe. Now, there's no sort of coding for this, but this is a reptile that was living inside the cured in place. So that was an example of where we actually re-CCTV Align, but it was for a different purpose. Okay, thank you very much for your time.